As I ventured further still into the unending cavern, each laborious step feeling as if a thousand syringes were piercing my blistered feet, I was enthralled by the ancient images etched on its limestone walls. Crude outlines of preternatural figures, too grotesque to resemble any earthly creature, were represented in a similar manner to how a saint might be immortalized by a stained-glass window in a cathedral. While I gazed upon the atavistic illustrations, I began to feel the sensation of motion. It seemed as though the floor below me was turning on its axis. I could not tell if this was due to the decrepit topography of the grotto or the addled machinations of an exhausted mind. So I just... take it? asked Logan. It's yours, assured the sage. It always has been. Logan took a long look at the pedestal until he edged his way into the pale light. Once he reached the center, he inched his hands towards the staff and held it gingerly. At first, it felt like nothing had changed. Well, that was a letdown, he thought. Just then, the artifact started to tremble, and Logan could feel its power. Energy began to course through his skin, creating a phenomenon he had never experienced before. What at first seemed like an ordinary stick now felt like destiny, given physical form in his grasp. What? What was that? Logan gasped, trying to make sense of it all. The old man simply nodded and beckoned back to him. You are now ready, Earthkeeper. At the ready, sir, Traver bellowed. Just say the word and I'll blast in the bits. No, evasive maneuvers. We're cutting our losses here, snapped Altaris with urgency. What? Come on, we can take this schmuzz. We can pick off a few Valov and Marauders, not a Gansing Connate fleet. Zilber, hightail us out of here. Sir, yes, sir, Zilber replied. The engines hummed at their maximum output as the Samson circled back and zipped away in the opposite direction, into the Steiner Belt. It was a small ship, making it easy for the crew to deftly avoid the military's fire. One of the meteors clipped to starboard, but the damage was chiefly superficial. By the time they passed Granix, the Khan's forces were out of their line of sight. The children all gathered and shouted hooray and ran to the zoo for Elephant Day. The zookeepers came and sang them a song so they could be elephants all the day long. At the end of the tune, the kids started to grow as they watched the tiny people below. With big ears on their head and big trunks on their noses, even their feet had big elephant toeses. With a trumpet of joy, they entered the zoo to do all the things that elephants do. Because here, or so I've heard people say, anyone could be an elephant on Elephant Day. Dana struggled to think of something, anything he could say that wouldn't sound awkward until he just blurted it out. I think you have pretty eyes. Really? Big cliche, don't you think? Snided Bailey. That's like the one thing people say when they can't think of a better compliment. I know, but it's true, Dana asserted. They were the first thing I noticed about you. Bailey raised one eyebrow in disbelief, but acquiesced. Okay, then. They turned their back to Dana and continued. Describe them. Regaining his composure, Dina took a deep breath and said, They're like a calming forest, leaves shifting in the wind, shining emeralds that light the room with their iridescence, pools of nature's beauty contained in, uh, two holes in a person's head. He cringed at that last part. Bailey spun around to face him again. Dude, they chuckled. You could have just said green, you know. Oh, Dana reacted, his cheeks fully flushed with embarrassment. S sorry. Nah, it was sweet, assured Bailey, their cheeks a little red as well.